We are live on YouTube now, no? Yeah. I'll just tell you when we're live. We're yeah. in the process. All done, sir. Go, sir. We are live, sir. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. And I welcome all the audience for this uh, Delhi Orthopedic Association Hand and Wrist Symposium. I welcome uh, Dr. Sharada Gawal, President Delhi Orthopedic Association. Dr. Hitesh Lal, Secretary Delhi Orthopedic Association. I welcome Dr. Vikas Gupta. He is a very uh, you know popular uh, hand surgeon in Delhi. Dr. Vikas Gupta. Uh, and I welcome Professor Kothwal, who is teacher of Vikas Gupta. So, and I uh, welcome Dr. Zulfi from UK, Dr. Akram, Dr. Tahir Ansari, and Professor Anil Bhatt, a very, very senior hand surgeon and professor of orthopedics from Manipal, and Dr. Ajit Tiwari. I invite now Dr. Sharada Garwal to uh, speak few words. Uh, Dr. Thanks, Shah. Dr. Manish. Uh, I, to, I welcome on behalf of Daily Orthopedic Association, the whole faculty, and all the participants who have joined us in this webinar. My special thanks to Dr. Vikas Gupta to prepare this webinar at a such a short notice with such galaxy of uh, uh, faculty stars we, we have now. Uh, they are very good lectures you have kept, sir. Uh, I think it's going to be great learning and we look forward to it. Uh, Dr. Vikas Gupta, I, I request you to start the proceedings. Uh, yeah. Dr. Vikas, uh, I hand over to you. Please give a short introduction to, of the whole faculty. Yeah. Good evening. First of all, uh, DAO conducts a hand course every year. It's a one-day program, but because of lockdown, this time we are having two hours webinar. So uh, let me introduce our faculty. In the in this uh, webinar, we have like uh, kept uh, topics which are relevant to everyone, orthopedic surgeons, starting from trigger finger fingertip injuries, distal radius, and scaphoid fractures. First, let me introduce my uh, faculty. Uh, Dr. Manish Dhawan, he's a coordinator. He's a uh, professor and senior consultant at uh, Gangaram. Special interest is in uh, fixed hitters, limb reconstructions. He's president of Asamiya India and treasurer of Indian Orthopedic Association. And he has been coordinating and helping us with all the things, whatever we are asking for. Professor Kotwal, uh, he needs no introduction. He's like Bhishma Pitama and hand surgeries, at least in this part of the country. And he's one of the senior most. He's ex-professor and head of uh, Department of Orthopedic Aims. He has more than 500 presentations and more than 120 publications. And I won't, if I introduce him completely, then I think we don't have time for his talk. Zulfi, a dear friend from UK, he's again uh, well trained uh, places like he has so many training fellowships. He did his undergraduation from Bristol and he did his MD from Leiden. Then he had his research fellowship from Stanford, hand fellowship, Barcelona, Paris, Reddington, Derby. Then he finished in his FRCS UK 2008, and he's a consultant orthopedic surgeon. He has a European hand diploma, and he's practicing in London. Professor Anil Bhatt, again, very, very dear, uh, dear friend. Um, and he's associated dean, professor in head hand and microsurgery unit at uh, KMC Manipal. And his talks are like really, he's a genius in teaching. Dr. Akram, again, my colleague, he's senior consultant. He's part of hand to shoulder division at Saket, Max Saket. Dr. Ajit Tewari, uh, again, he's in Kanpur, practicing in Kanpur, fellowship trained, uh, trained at Pune, Coimbatore, and Singapore, currently practicing at Regency Hospital, Kanpur. Vineet, uh, he's an associate professor in charge of hand clinic orthopedics at Mamsi, Delhi. He is in his fellowship from Singapore as well as Canada. Tahir, again, very dear friend, is additional professor at Ames and he has a number of publications and a number of talks. His fellowship he has done from Spain and trained at Germany. And this is myself, I'm working at Max. Now, 
we'll start our session first of all we'll start with dr anil bhat he will be talking about fra acute fracture scaphoid and their management dr anil i think you can take the screen uh, thank you vikas and i thank uh, the delhi orthopedic association and their members for this opportunity i was there uh, i think last year or one year or two years back for the same kind of course and it's always nice to uh, be back with them again uh, my topic basically is on acute uh, scaphoid fractures and uh, i would just uh, start off with uh, uh, basically kind of a case based kind of scenarios and then go on to the actual uh, uh, approach to it so most of the time young male i mean young patients they usually come with a history of fall and the classic history would be an fallen outstretched hand hyperextended wrist and they always have this radial sided pain now the important thing is here usually they come a couple of days later a lot of times because generally they are low energy injuries and uh, the possibilities to be kept in mind for a radial sided pain would be obviously distal radius fracture these are the patients obviously would come quite early because of the pain and swelling but if it's a scaphoid or a scaphoid kind of injury on the radial side they might come a little later and that's what needs to be alerted uh, uh, when they take when you take the history sometimes there could be a cmc joint kind of injuries bennets and rolandos kind of thing and sometimes they could be neglected again so can we get more information on physical examination this is basically for the postgraduates who logged in and if you see the scaphoid is quite a big bone and it has many parts and so a lot of times we always start anatomical stuff box tendon which is basically the waist we always forget these ends the proximal and the distal poles so the anatomical stuff box tendon is basically talks to you about actually just the waist and then even if you actually look at this uh, there's it doesn't actually correspond to the waist as such so when you palpate these patients uh, it's better to move the wrist you know to the ulnar deviation so that the scaphoid extends and that's when you actually uh, 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 get the waist of the scaphoid so moving the wrist to check the tendinitis is is a very important point for you to elicit the tendinitis if you want to look at the distal pole actually it is on the ulnar side so it's it's so you need to look at all three areas lateral ulnar and dorsal all three areas for you to palpate the scaphoid for you to get the along the fcr tendon here if you palpate that will be your distal pole and proximal pole is on the dorsum so you don't have to miss out on all these areas the listus tubercle is acts like a lighthouse for you and then the sulcus just distal to that will give you the scaphoid joint here and it gives you two things one is the proximal pole and one is the scaphoid ligament so one of these could be injured and that is what you need to be looking at at this area when you palpate this and you can do a couple of provocative maneuvers like scaphoid compression test or a resisted pronation test both of these can yield your clinical outcomes in terms of physical examination so a snuff box tendon is with tubercle tendon is is quite less specific but when you add the compression test your specificity increases to almost 75% so this is the basic clinical examination somebody has to do and once you suspect scaphoid fracture we obviously ask for x rays and the x rays basically are the pa lateral and the pa in full ulnar deviation and one of the other ways to do it is also to you know make a fist and take the ulnar deviation that will be a better way of actually doing it and then you add the oblique views uh, you add the oblique views here and then that gives you a much more uh, increase in the specificity again and sensitivity to almost 100% this was the patient x ray who came the case scenario he told hardly we could we could make out any fracture here and but then patient had tenderness in the anatomical stuff box so if radiograph are inconclusive then what would you do because almost up to 25% are not visible on initial radiographs and the classical teaching whatever has been taught to us is basically put them on a slab or a cast wait for two weeks call them back check clinically and repeat x ray and take a decision and that's what we did for this patient and if you see carefully that you would see the fracture line uh, staring at you at that point two weeks later but that doesn't happen always right and if the patient is not willing for the cast he says no i don't want to put a, put me on a cast and i don't want to wait for two weeks can you get an x can you get the diagnosis then the of the second line of investigation or imaging should be always an mri okay so in negative radiographs the second line is always an mri 
because it picks up the marrow edema of the fracture with a low intensity kind of a signal if there's a fracture within 24 to 48 hours. And the other advantage is it identifies fractures of other carpal bones and especially the ligament injuries, right? It's got the highest sensitivity and specificity. So if the x-rays are negative, what we call as apple fractures, then we can go on for an MRI. Now, this is another male patient with the history of fall Monday ago, pain on moving the wrist. And what you now see is actually you're seeing the fracture line on the x-ray itself straight away. So you don't, it, it's visible. But then you need to now decide on whether what should I do in terms of it, whether it's a conservative management or an operative management, then the answer would be to get a CT done. So if you're seeing the X-ray or, I mean, the fracture on the X-ray, the dictum is basically, if you want more information, get a CT done. If you don't see a fracture, get an MRI done, right? So for you to plan surgically to diagnose any additional bony injuries, but always make sure that you ask a scan, CT scan oriented to the long tunnel axis of the scaphoid and then reconstruct the whole thing. And it's also useful for assessment of healing. The most important thing is when you ask for the CT, the normal CTs are done at three millimeter cuts. For scape for you need to specifically ask your radiologist to get a one millimeter cut for you to pick these small fractures, plus if you want to see the displacement. Okay, occult fractures sometimes are not diagnosed by the CT scan itself. So the take home message here is MRI to diagnose in X-ray negative cases, and CT, if you see the fracture line on X-ray and then to decide on surgery versus conservative approach. The questions now come, once the fracture is diagnosed, which ones to treat non-operatively, which ones require surgery, and what is the method or the implant? So the most important determinant is the stability of the fracture itself. A stable fracture can be treated non-operatively and an unstable one obviously would go for uh, fixation because we know the problems with the scaphoid in terms of vascularity and non-unions. The location of fracture is important and what the patient wants, very, very important. So if you look at the classification itself, there's hardly anything which is stable. A tubercle here or an incomplete fracture like this through the waist is probably the only stable fractures. Even a complete weight based of the fra fracture of the waist here, even though it's undisplaced, can become unstable eventually. So we need to be careful with this. And what is stability? More than one millimeter displacement. In a distal radius, we are talking of two millimeters here. It's just a millimeter displacement. If you draw the angle, if the scaphoid fracture is displaced, if you draw the angle, this intra-scaphoid angle, if it's more than 35 degrees, if there's bone loss or combination, all proximal poles are unstable a DC kind of an element, and of course, perilunate kind of fracture dislocations. So close treatment basically is for stable, non-displaced fractures. We know that cast immobilization gives very good results, and a short-arm cast for six to eight weeks especially uh, is good enough. In the waist, can go up to almost 12 weeks sometimes. A long-arm cast for non-compliant patients, so there's a controversy, but there's uh, no controversy in terms of the uh, risk of uh, uh, position itself, neutral position, almost up to 90-93% union rates. So this, as long as it's stable, undisplaced, and probably incomplete fractures, this is good enough for this. So the question comes now is when is a surgical treatment required? And unstable fractures, displaced or combinated fractures definitely require it. And as I said, patient factors. If patient is young, active manual worker, like the first, uh, the second case I showed you, or athletes, patients with high demand occupation and who want to go for an early range of motion. And these are the fact patients we need to think probably of operative uh, kind of an uh, fixation. And internal fixation can be percutaneous, both volar or dorsal. It can be open method, can be arthroscopic assisted. There might be sometimes a role for bone grafting primarily if the, the surgeon feels unsafe. KORs generally are given up, but very small proximal bone fractures, open injuries, multi-trauma situation, you still have to keep them in your armamentarium. We have moved on to the headless cannulated screws, which gives much more uh, a stable kind of a compression. The percutaneous technique, as I said, stable fractures, but then patient wants early range of motion and return of activity, you might consider that. But otherwise, unstable fractures, when fractures can, which can be reduced, definitely you can go for percutaneous technique, which is least invasive in terms of vascular disturbance and the soft tissue dissection, okay? The polar approach, what I'm showing is the entry point is always very difficult if the wrist is in this position, in a, in a neutral kind of a position. But if you hyperextend the wrist, the scaphoid comes out here, and then that becomes easy for you to go into the, uh, to try to get into the axis of the scaphoid itself. 
in the OLR approach, it's very difficult to get the central access compared to a dorsal approach, but then still it's manageable. So this is how a OLR percutaneous uh, fixation happens. You draw the axis of the scapegoid, both in the AP and the lateral, and the intersecting point is there uh, where you need to enter your guidewire. And spend a lot of time on this because the guidewire entry is the most important step. Everything happens over the guidewire. So if you misplace the guidewire or put in multiple times, you are creating a lot of false passages. So try to use, make this the most accurate step of your polar percutaneous fixation. So once you get in the wire guidewire, make sure you check it in all the directions here. In the both in the AP view and in the lateral view, you check. And if you want, you can actually screen this all the 360 degrees and make sure that your wire is dead central if possible, whenever possible, or at least it's it's you know in the longest possible axis, whatever you can get. So make sure you do the 360 degree kind of a uh, screening on your on the table and uh, get it right. And the next is everything happens as I said over the guide wires. You make a tiny incision in the skin there spread it out with an artery forceps and then you put in your measure inside and measure the depth, uh, measure the size of the uh, scaphoid itself. So once you do that, whenever you measure, remember at least minus about five to six millimeters, between four to six millimeters rather, depending on one is a fracture gap and then you need to bury the screw inside the cartilage, right? So you need to uh, do that so that you don't end up with having a longer screw. You can drill the, the entry point a little. A lot of times you might not require, and then you put in the screw through this. And then uh, there are systems where you can bury the screw nicely. This is another case, actually, we had a distal radius and then we had a scaphoid also. So uh, in this instrument, it tells now that the screwdriver is seating nicely here. And once you go to the LO mark here, it means it is flush with the bone surface. The screw is flush with the bone surface. And once the red mark goes inside like this, it means that it's buried about two millimeters inside. So that is the significance of using this kind of a screwdriver. Open technique, when acute displaced fracture are not uh, reduced by closed methods, you have combination there. Then for distal and waist fractures, and especially it, it's useful to correct the humpback deformity. And it is it causes the least disturbance to blood supply because most of the blood supply comes from the dorsal side. It will give you good visualization but then you need to cut through the capsule. So there might be some amount of stiffness. And uh, so this is the way I'm sure all of you know how to do it. It's kind of a small hockey kind of stick or a J-shaped kind of an incision there, right? What we do, go through is through the FCR tendon sheath. So that is the uh, sheath covering the FCR tendon, both uh, palmar and dorsally. So just retract the tendon and then you need to go through the wrist capsule. So if you look carefully there, I'm just, Dissecting. So this is a capsule here. Uh, there are different types of incision. There is a ligament sparing incision for the radius cap capitate. Is that kind of an incision? I prefer to go straight through and through with it so that I get a thick kind of a bites later to repair the capsule. So you go all the way in and you'll start seeing the fracture side there. And it's a single cut till you get to the radiocarpal joint, all, all the way to the uh, radiocarpal joint. So once you get in there, the steps are the same. You put in your guide wire. Now um, it's all under vision, so you, you can definitely again check under the CM the same maneuver. And then you put in the screw, okay? And same kind of uh, maneuver which I showed you earlier for the percutaneous thing, right? But the most, again, important thing is to screen and check whether your screw is nicely seating and it's not, especially in the lateral, it's not projecting out dorsally because that can cause a lot of uh, soft tissue irritation. And the other point is when you do this, you also screen the wrist, okay? You screen the wrist like this so that you don't, you don't miss out on any scapho kind of injuries, okay? And this tells you that there's no couple instability. This is very, very important. And then you need a good closure there of the scaphoid here, uh, the, the capsule here, so that you don't uh, end up in any kind of instability. Now, there's another case, patient comes with a history of fall from a height, and what you see now is basically a proximal hole of uh, fracture. And remember, these are very tiny fragments. There are tenuous blood supply, they are intra-articular locations, the long liver arm stress at the fracture site here. And so all displaced or undisplaced proximal pole should be considered as unstable and require fixation, percutaneous at least, because uh, no point putting them in a cast and waiting them for them to heal. Now, 
generally we try to approach it directly which means the dorsal approach is a better one and that's where the screw can be placed in central axis and you can visualize the scaphal unit ligament the only problem is the wrist needs to be hyperflex for you to enter the guide wire there and which can displace the fracture site it can be percutaneous or a mini open technique so this is what i meant you need to hyperflex for you to you know get the entry point this is a 14 gauge needle which can be used as a sleeve for the guide wire so once you hyperflex you will see the distal and the proximal pole overlapping like it's called as the double ring sign so that's the center point is where you have to go in and put in your guide wire there okay so you come out but then you need to come out here on this side because you can't extend the wrist now to check the lateral so you have to come out and pull it back so that you are in flush now that's the time you can extend from here to here and check the lateral view otherwise you can't do that and once it is there inside you can put another additional view as an anti rotation kind of a wire and then put in the screw from the dorsal side like this okay if you can't really get that entry point you can make a small opening here right a mini approach here you would see the scaphoid and the scaphal unit ligament there and the rest of the steps is the same you measure you put in the screw there and you might end up with a very tiny small cartilage defect which will heal nicely and that's what is the mini open technique now imagine this is a, a slightly displaced fracture you can reduce it by using joysticks like this you don't have to open this okay so this is the way we do it you take it more ulnarly the distal pole and this is more towards the radial side and that will reduce it and align it nicely and the rest of the procedure is same where you put in a bucketing screw there is an option for arthroscopic assisted kind of a reduction especially patients coming at probably two or three weeks later where you really you know that the fibrous tissue has started forming there it might probably go for a non union all you want is to freshen that uh, fibrous tissue there uh, what you can do is you can go in uh, i'm just showing that i'm going through the mid carpal portal here this is the mid carpal radial portal here uh, you go through that okay and once you enter the mid carpal joint what you see so that's the capitate there and this is the scaphoid here and you would go through the this is the fracture site here at this point all you need is used to freshen the edges you know so that you get fresh bleeding there on the fibrous tissue is taken off and then you can do your percutaneous fixation so this is probably useful in patients uh where patients come late two three weeks later where you might have to open it instead of that this is an option which is available now and those who are trained can obviously do this and uh, people are now obviously doing even non union scaphoids with arthroscopic assistance so you just uh, freshen the edges with your shaver there and then once that is done you uh, put in your percutaneous fixation so question now comes should we fix all the fractures not necessary if they are undisplaced you can put them on a cast right at at 6 weeks when the patient comes back remove the cast examine for tenderness take x rays if there is a fracture gap on x ray or there is clinical tenderness get a ct scan done and studies have shown that those with less than 2 mm you can further increase the cast mobilization for about 2 to 4 weeks again but if the gap is more than 2 mm advise the patient for a percutaneous fixation in that way more no patient would go in for a, a non union later so we have published this and this is always this kind of aggressive preservative treatment is always given us uh, good results to summarize mri should be the second line of investigation to diagnose occult fractures when you don't see the fracture line on x ray uh, if you see the fracture line on x ray ct would be better for planning the course of the treatment and later for healing also instability you know what is stable what is unstable whenever you see unstable fractures treat operatively percutaneous technique causes the least vascular disturbance and arthroscopic assistance may avoid open procedures in future thank you so much thanks for professor anil what for such a nice uh, presentation very informative now we have time for 5 to 7 minutes for questions so i request the panelists to put questions to professor anil bhat dr vikas can you hear me is muted uh... so uh, any questions for professor anil bhat from the panelist yes dr sharad yeah dr bhat uh, thanks for the excellent uh, lecture uh, just small query i have that you spoke about lateral uh, uh, intra scaphoid angle i believe yeah. 
it to be measured on a lateral view or a oblique view? Uh, basically, this is whenever the fracture fragments are displaced. So right. classically, you would see that uh, in a lateral view, and then you would take the axis of the proximal fragment and the distal fragment. So you need to draw those lines, and then you get the angle of uh, whatever is there. And generally, if it is beyond 30, 35 degrees, it means that it's quite an unstable. It means it's going for a humpback kind of a deformity. And that's when you would want to correct that. And that's when you have to fix it. Yes. Can I ask a question? Hello. Yes, Dr. Kutwal. Yes. Uh, very nice lecture, uh, Anil. Thank you, sir. Uh, a question. There are two questions, in fact. One is that you said that you don't drill it. Would you yeah. drill it or uh, only the outer cortex or no drill at all? And in uh, a patient, are you able to put the screw without uh, drilling all the way to, into the scaphoid? Yeah. I usually drill only the entry point most of the times. Uh, if you see... Uh, the only problem, if at all the bone is really hard and cortical bone, you might strip the threads if you really force the screw in. But majority of the times, uh, over the years, I've seen that the screw goes in nicely. And if I find any difficulty at any point of time, I go back and drill it. Otherwise, a lot of times, we are creating, honestly, quite a big hole. The screw is already occupying that space. So the entry point is good enough for most cases. Okay. At least in my personal experience. Okay. And the second question is, uh, what is the period of uh, external immobilization after uh, screw fixation? Uh, after percutaneous, sir? Yeah, any uh, screw fixation. Yeah, percutaneous fixation, generally we uh, put them on a, a scaphoid uh, short-term thumb spike or slab for about 10 days to 3 weeks. And then with the splint, we start mobilizing them. Okay. Okay. Uh, there is a question from Dr. Hitesh. Hitesh? Yeah, Dr. Bhatt, it was a very nice presentation. I would like to ask what reduction maneuvers you do for reducing these fractures and do you practice that volar percutaneous approach or you do always the dorsal percutaneous approach? Okay. Most of the fractures, just with a gentle uh, axial traction, most of them reduce. Uh, that's what we see. And if they're not reducing in this position, in this particular position means there is probably a combination and then you might have to probably open it. Percutaneous might not be a good option then. And waist fractures, dorsal, I mean, uh, distal fractures, I go through the volar side and the proximal ones, I go very small fragment proximal, I, I go to the dorsal side. But if the fragment, proximal fragment is, is a little bigger, I don't mind even going through the volar side as long as I can catch the fragment. Uh, Dr. Bhatt, there is a question from the audience that there is yeah. any reported case of unicortical scaphoid fracture? I mean, we see a lot of these occult fractures and when we see that uh, basically it could be a, a, a displaced, I mean, sorry, a unplaced uh, kind of an incomplete fracture. I won't call it unicortical. I would probably call it a, 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 a incomplete kind of fracture. It's like, you know, garden staging in fracture neck fever. So, similar to that, so there might be uh, incomplete fractures and uh, I have not really classified them into a unicortical or a bicortical. So, it can be uh, many, I mean, incomplete. Uh, incomplete or a complete fracture. Yeah. Uh, uh, Professor Bhatt, uh, Dr. Zulfi has a question for you. Dr. Zulfi? Yeah, thank you, Professor Bhatt. That's a wonderful presentation. Um, I just have, I have uh, one technical tip that per perhaps could help the audience as well as... Uh, Professor Kotwal, when I'm drilling these scaphoids, when you put your guide wire, I agree entirely, that's the most important step of this procedure. When you pull your drill back out, you lose your wire. It comes out with the drill bit. So be very careful uh, to make sure that I often put another wire. So as a derotational uh, option, but also to make sure that your original wire stays in. That's a very, um, very <coughs> learned point. My, my question to you, uh, Professor Bhatt, is, in terms of your conservative management, do you include the thumb in your in your splint or without the uh, thumb? Yeah, I think uh, enough uh, studies have been done. There's an RCT done by Joseph Dias. So thumb is included. Uh, I always include a thumb, but I won't include the IP joint. It will never definitely go till the nail or, you know, till the tip of it. IP can be left free. I, I still go by the basic thing that one joint above and one joint below. That's all is my principle of treating it, which means that you have the scaphoid, you have the CMC joint. I just go one joint above, which means the MCP joint. The IP can be left free. 
but the thumb can be there. There are enough studies also proving that thumb need not be there, but I would feel safe with my patients, the thumb to be included because I stay in a student town, university, they'll, the next day they'll be all on the bikes and running around. So, Right. Thank you. Any any other question for Professor Bhatt? On the sir, but sir, but sir, uh, it's, always, it's always joy to listen to your, your wonderful talk, sir. So my question is that, uh, how, what is the upper limit of considering cutaneous fixation for the waist fracture? Upper limit of? Upper limit of, I mean that how old fracture you will consider as a percutaneous versus open reduction and fixation. Okay. Uh, it's not just the duration again, it's it's also the where the fracture is located. Second, I would by then obviously I would be getting a CT and see the amount of combination or displacement, right? So I need to put in all these factors uh, before Ramesh I decide where, where probably, probably I might be tempted to put in a primary graft also. Okay. So undisplaced waist fracture. Even up to three weeks, I would I would still, if everything is fine, I would still percutaneously fix it. Ajit, okay. can I uh, Oh, Anil, if you allow, can I answer him? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. See, even fibrous non-union, you can go percutaneous if it is not displaced. So there are a lot of studies coming up, like fibrous non-unions, you can do it. So duration is not the limit. Another okay. thing, I just want to re reinforce what uh, Anil had said. See, all of us ask for CT scan, just normal CT scan for the scaphoid fracture. We have to ask them whether it should be in the longitudinal on the axis of the scaphoid. Otherwise, many times we miss the cut between the between the cut, we miss the fracture. That I just wanted to reinforce what Anil had already said. A question to you, Anil. What what do you think about trans trapezoidal pocket inis for the volar approach? Okay. What are your views? Uh, I I don't know. I've been lucky enough in that sense that I've never done that. Uh, in the sense that I've always got my entry points. And uh, even with the open, I've never gone through the uh, trapezium for that matter. It's always, uh, I always keep them directly on the CR with the uh, with uh, towel underneath, right? So I don't use a hand table for percutaneous fixation. I'll always keep directly on the scale so that I see the scaphoid nicely. That is one. And second, make sure you hyperextend it. Most of the times so you're able to get in through that. So I've never done that personally, but I know the technique is described. And the other one, which uh, Zulfi said about uh, putting an additional wire so that your guide wire doesn't come. One of the other thing you can do is once you measure the length, you just push the wire into the radius, just lock it there, and then you do the rest of it and then pull out the guide wire later. Uh, Doctor, other advantage, other advantage. Uh, how many times? I think I have broken wire three times while doing pocket tennis. I, I have done it like because we get a bent wire. Once. The more you do, the more you break. It's not like if you've not broken anything, so, means you, you're not a so good option. It's always better, always better you keep it like what Anil had said. You pass your wire across and put your hemostat on it so that at least you can retrieve your broken wire. Yeah. Any any other questions, Dr. Manish? Dr. Vikas, we are actually, no, we don't have questions from the audience, but I think we should go there to the next question, speaker. Dr. Tahir. Uh, Dr. Tahir, you have a question, the yeah. last question. Yes, sir. I like to add a little bit regarding the with thumb, without thumb. Actually, uh, when we read... Uh, In the meantime, studies, I'll share my screen. So, there's a definite indication there where we must include thumb. One is hyperlapse individual. Second is smoker. And third is non-compliant patient. And uh, I like to learn about one more thing regarding reduction maneuver. One is lean sheet maneuver, which is very useful once you're dealing with a little bit older patients when they are present around six to eight weeks. So you have to counter the DC and fix those fractures from the owner's side. So Dr. Bhatt, I think he will elaborate it further. Dr. Bhatt? So Dr. I didn't get that. Uh, regarding the patient who present late, basically six to eight weeks, uh, we have to use, uh, we have to counter the DC with the lean sheet maneuver. Yeah. Uh, we have yeah. to flex the, uh, to counter DC, you have to flex the wrist and then yeah. fix the lunate, then extend it and fix the scaphoid from the volar side. Okay. Sometimes, if you're not able to reduce it that way, then yeah. use the knee sheet maneuver. Correct. I would probably put in a wire from here, from the dorsal side to the lunate, make sure it's neutral. Yeah. 
and then I go do that. Yeah. Doctor Doctor Bhatt, Professor Bhatt, there is a question from the audience. What is the thickness of wire used for percutaneous fixation? Thickness of the wire used for percutaneous fixation. They're talking of guide wire or. Yeah, the guide wire which you use for percutaneous fixation. Guide wire is, is about, I think it's 1.1 millimeter, 1.1. And then you have 1.5 okay. drill bit, the screw is 2.4. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Dr. Vikas, I think we are running, you know, late. So, I think you can go in for your presentation. Okay. We'll take uh, questions I'll later just, on. I'll just pick up from where uh, Anil left. So, most of these fractures, they would unite. Uh, conservatively by percutaneous or RF or uh, conservatively, but some may go in non union. This is myself 30 years back, had a stepoid fracture. But what are the reasons? Why do non union occur? If it is a, a unstable fracture, displacement is more than one millimeter, or fracture gets displaced during the cast or treated inadequately, they would go in non union. But many non unions, they are asymptomatic. So uh, the question arises, should we treat them asymptomatic non-unions? The answer is yes, we should treat them because 100%, almost 100% of them will go into arthritis if we don't treat them. Uh, the literature supports Mac et al. 1984. This uh, followed up uh, 47 non-unions and they saw that all of them developed degenerative changes after five years. Again, another Belsky in 1985, they have followed up 55 non-unions for more than 10 years, they found that all had significant arthrosis by 10 years. So we should treat them. Another reason is uh, uh, results are uh, good and uh, our results of treating non-union, they are good. Up to 95% uh, union rates have been reported. So what do we do? Just like any non-union, we should use bone drafts. Uh, we use, as Anil had already said, uh, bone drafts can be used in, well, there's a combination in acute cases, but delayed and non-union, we use bone draft. And what type of bone drafts? Bone drafts could be electris, lower end radius, muscle pedicle, pedicular vascularized, or free vascularized from femoral condyle or electris. So earliest uh, literature, we could see Matty Rassi described about the graft in which cortical cancellous graft was used, which used to fix, but it was a difficult procedure because you have to create a tough and exactly matching graft to give the stability. Uh, Fernandez came up with a much better or much simpler technique, pression the graft, just like what we do, pression graft, put a cancellous, cortical cancellous wedge shape graft to correct the deformity and fix it with the help of the screw, something like this. You, this is scaphoid with a cancellous, cortical cancellous wedge shape graft. You fix it with the help of screw and a K wire, derotation K wire. And at eight weeks, uh, you can see the union. A wedge graft uh, uh, are used sometimes because if it is unstable, we can use two screws to get a rotational stability. Uh, this is the same patient at three months follow up, uh, union occurring the same in the same patient. Sometimes we fix the graft with the help of the mini screw, 1.3 mm uh, screws are used because many times graft, we see grafts are extruded. So uh, you can fix the graft with the help of a mini screw. So there's a big screw, fix, uh, Hubbard Whipple, which is fixing the fracture, other screw is fixing the graft. But again, vascularized graft, we use mainly for the proximal pole fractures, non-union proximal pole or proximal pole a vascular necrosis, we use vascularized graft. First vascularized graft was described by Roy Kameli in 1965, uh, which was uh, uh, based on APV graft. Then Braun uh, described Tornado Quadratus, which became very popular. Uh, Zedenberg uh, uh, described one to ICRSA graft, which we'll be discussing. Then there are other femoral uh, condyle graft, uh, also. Uh, periosteal femoral condyle graft, but we'll be focusing our talk on uh, dorsal uh, graft, or dorsal vascularized graft. If you see this anatomy, so this is, these are the small arteries. This is the main radial artery. This is the main ulnar artery. And this is a small vasculature, which is around the normal elbow. So our graft is based on one to 
supra compartmental artery which is uh, arising from the radial artery going up to the uh, dorsal part of the radial styloid we take a graft from here so first we'll see the schematic diagram we take a graft and with the help of with the periosteum and uh, put it uh, create a trough across the fracture site and insert a graft and fix the graft so this is a artery which we are talking about it's around 0.3 mm uh, first to intercompartmental supra retinacular artery or in short one to icrsa artery once you dissect the artery with the help of a pedicle then you real, if you release the tunica you see the graft bleeding the punctate bleeding from the punctate ble bleeding from the cancellous part and then from the edge shows that uh, graft is vascularized and then you create your uh, uh, trough into the uh, fracture this is a, by when you correct the fracture deformity this is the defect which you see so that is a pedicle that is a graph which comes into the trough so this is 45 year old male with a non union scaphoid Uh, this is six and a half months the uh, old injury. So this was a pedicle uh, artery dissected the capsule and created a trough. Then you, by creating trough, you can use high speed burr to give the shape and fashion the margins with the burr so that your graft should be exactly fitting across the fracture site. Once it is there, this is your base which has been prepared. A fracture site which has been prepared. This is the graph in a very enlarged view. You can see the bleeding from the graph. And, uh, this is a small modification we do we, uh, because many times we have seen that our uh, graph gets displaced if it is not compressed properly or there is a small mismatch in the size. So we use a Ethebond suture to fix the graph. The suture is taken from the edges of the trough and over it this is used so this is a small uh, modification which keeps our graft in place secure and this is a case proximal pole fracture which was uh, vascularized graft was used and fixed with a screw and uh, three months follow up you can see the good union <coughs> this is the ct scan of the same patient this is a graft this is the donor site and the screw that this is a transfer section so we don't see whole fracture at, in one time another case non non union nine months old non union scaphoid in which uh, uh, vascularized graft was used this was the graft this is the donor site and this was six months follow up after the surgery patient having good movements after vascularized grafting non union another case 27 year old male with a fracture, um, it was six months old injury, um, which a fracture proximal pole with MRI showing signs of AVN. 16 weeks post-op, you can see, start seeing the union and the movements. So here we would like to emphasize the AVN persisted, AVN goes very, uh, so on radiographically, AVN takes long time to go, but fracture unite uh, fracture is united, so which in turn uh, tells us that biology is working and fracture union is occurring. So this is one of the case. Same case, the uh, spec was done for the vascularized graph to show the uh, vascularity. So another case in which humpback de deformity was there. So slight modification is done in which we take our incision and take it distally in uh, more proximally so that we can see from the volar side, correct the deformity. In this case, because incision is going volar words, our screw entry goes just like a percutaneous wire from the small stab incision. So you're correcting the deformity vascularized, you're using a vascularized graph, as well as fixing with the dorsal approach. Other modification people are now using is a volar graph, Volar lip vascular pedicle graft, but 
uh, that time that uh, procedure was not described. So this modification was done at that time. Same thing, uh, we're showing that correction of the humpback deformity. And this is how uh, uh, screw is uh, put from the another stab incision. So if we review the literature, we, we can say that in MRI, we can assess early union after vesculous bone grafting as early as three months. If I don't even, uh, if, uh, uh, it is, sorry, uh, vascularized bone grafting is mandatory when there is a non-vascularized sclerotic fragment. That means there is a proximal pole fracture with the AVN. These cases, the vascularized graft works well. Uh, other cases, uh, the depending on surgeon experience and preference, it's uh, not significant difference in the result. So main indication would be uh, proximal pole non-union avascular necrosis of proximal pole with the non-union. But some patients, they would present late. When they present late, uh, the scaphoid cannot be uh, salvaged. So we do other procedures like partial fusions, which I'll not go through it because Dr. Zulfi would be talking about it. So in summary, non-union should be treated and they have a very good result of fixation and bone grafting. And vascularized bone grafting is useful, especially in cases of proximal pore factors with AVN. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vikas for such a nice presentation. Now your presentation is open for discussion by the panelists. So uh, Dr. Hitesh has a question for you. And Dr. Vikas, before you answer this question, can you tell the next speaker to set up his screen? Who is the uh, next speaker? Dr. Akram. Dr. Akram is, thank you. So I think we can, uh, Zulfi, can, is your talk, because that can be in continuity with the partial fusion, like, are you ready for the next um, talk? Yeah. One second. Am I up next? Yeah, 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 yeah next. Mm -hmm. Dr. Vikas, so it was a very nice talk. Uh, I have one question. Uh, I've done a few of these procedures and what is the difficulty in retaining the graft there? So have you used K-wires for holding that or you prefer your own technique of Prithibon? See, suture, because the, uh, uh, putting a, in, especially in vascularized uh, drilling or putting in a K-wire, it just strips off the periosteum so it can strangulate the graft and vascularity can be jeopardized. So we try to, we don't take suture through the graft, we take suture through the trough from the edges and then the suture sits on the graft so that graft doesn't extrude. What is the size of the suture you use? We're using Ethibon 2.0. Okay. Dr. Tahir. Yeah, uh, thank you, sir. It's a very nice presentation and I can say I have witnessed these results. These are really wonderful, sir. <laughs> I just uh, like a little bit uh, of your experience because I like to uh, convey to many uh, junior colleagues who are watching this, what is the learning curve basically? Somebody seeing your presentation, they should not uh, start doing this directly. I think uh, I, I, I like to listen directly from you. What is the learning curve for that? See, okay. Uh, I'll say vascularized graph. Uh, uh, when I was uh, at Ames with you, when your thesis was there, we were doing more vascularized graft. Like my indications are now very limited. AVN proximal pole, that is my indication. Revision surgery, that is one of the indication. The reason is the amount of stiffness after vascularized graft is definitely more than if you use a normal or if bone grafting, stiffness is definitely less. So as our learning curve goes, our, our indications, we become more selective. And we are definitely, I'll not do for every cases, or especially for waste or non-union where I can do the simple or bone grafting, but still for proximal pole fractures, especially avian, I'll go for a ZMB procedure. Thank you. Any other question for Dr. Vikas from the panelist? Uh, can I ask you a question, uh, Dr. Uh, Anish? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Vikas, uh, uh, doing this kind of a procedure of vascular grafting, which of course has got a quite a uh, learning curve, 
just excision of the proximal pole will that be uh, give inferior no, uh, excision proximal pole I, I don't think nowadays it is advisable uh, just excising because the proximal pole the insertion of scaphoid ligament is there you excise the proximal pole you are uh, compromising on scaphoid ligament also suppose it is very thin like wafer thin then we'll say uh, something like avulsion fracture of the scaphoid lunate then i'll say you fix it with the anchor but if you remove the proximal pole uh, long term results are just like slack wrist that scaphoid lunate advanced collapse happens within years so that's not a procedure for choice right. because what's your criteria yeah. for diagnosing abn see uh, okay uh, if they are late 8 months 9 months down the line you can see on x ray but definitely if it is a proximal pole 3 to 3 months 6 months we can have a on mri we can see avian but not not before that and that to one of our one of our colleagues who scalar muscular skeletal he does a uh, uh, like enhanced scans gadolinium scans so which yeah. in which he can talk more about avascular yeah i was coming to the point where we know that mri always doesn't pick up uh, the avian in its right sense what looks like avian is actually not avian in most of the mris and so there's enough controversies as to using the mri as a guide for avian and uh, people have now they're now talking of uh, you know uh, fluid uh, Uh, rather contrast enhanced or in terms of a dynamic kind of a flow kind of mri yeah, yeah. Uh, so that is what is being talked of because whatever you yeah, see that's what uh, uh, radiologists they yeah they do uh, enhance like uh, either they give a iv and contrast enhance or they they have a special sequence after injecting to see that's the flow right. but again nothing is 100% i'll say if it is a proximal pole I, i'm more favoring vascularize if it is a waste whatever it is i'll favor more towards a normal grafting like non vascularize yeah what about your results like uh, do you see more stiffness in vascularized yeah uh, definitely because you are you have to open the capsule and a lot of times you might not be able to repair the capsule back and things like that so there's a lot of soft tissue dissection which is happening and again the point now comes is there enough literature now which says that uh, even non vascularized grafts are good enough for even you know, you know these proximal pole non union yeah. uh, good cancellous grafts punched in nicely and they could do as good as a vascularized graft so there's enough literature coming out uh, studies coming out to show that all so and we have some experience on that where we yeah. punch in a lot of impact nice uh, fine uh, cancellous we compacted with a yeah and, and, and we have, we have found always uh, them uniting so it's a exciting uh, area where you are looking at uh, mris uh, which are not the static regular mris but something which is more of dynamic kind of mri flow mris you are looking at non cancellous non vascular grafts into these non unions proximal poles i think in the next 2 3 years there will be a lot of new literature coming out on this Uh, Dr. Vikas, uh, yeah. uh, can you so, uh, now can we uh, uh, allow Dr. Yeah, Dr. Zulfi, please invite him. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Zulfi, uh, are you ready with your presentation? I'm ready. Have yeah, you got yeah. my PowerPoint up there? Are you? It's yeah, visible yeah, we for can everyone? see your PowerPoint. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. Okay, good. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Manish, moderator for this session, and uh, Vikas. Uh, thank you for inviting me here. and all my other colleagues out there the national greeting now in the uk is namaste by the way because of the covid um i've been asked to talk about the treatment options of a wrist arthritis in the younger more active population and um it so it's taking a little bit away from the scaphoid and going more to the distal radius I'll share with you the type of patient first of all that uh we're considering here. This is the the type of patient A on the left patient A uh dash on the radial pathology. Uh, it looks pretty minimal affecting the radial scaphoid fossa. And then the slightly more elaborate type of uh, fracture pattern. This patient unfortunately was uh I would say maltreated but they tried their best. 
uh, the distal radial uh, fracture pattern here, as you can see. And another patient uh, C where uh, was treated with an external fixation and uh, multiple K wires. Now, what all these uh, patients have in common is that they are all highly difficult fractures to treat, in my opinion. They're very comminuted intra-articular distal radial fractures. This could be die punch type of uh, fractures. Uh, you could extend this to Keenbox type of disease uh, of the lunate with uh, ongoing arthritic changes, uh, simply leading to isolated radiocarpal arthritis. Uh, this, um, uh, this presentation actually formed part of a study that I collaborated with Marc Garcielias when I was a fellow in Barcelona. We thought of another plan. Uh, rather, than, um, uh, rather than consider a more uh, definitive fusion of such a wrist, why not preserve the mid carpus when you know that the radiocarpal joint is, um, is, is destroyed? So I put it to you as the panel, but also to the audience out there. When you look at such an X-ray, what are your options? Now, obviously, I'm not there to get a hands show up there, but I would, under normal circumstances, everyone to raise their hand and say, how would you treat such a typical young adult who's got uh, isolated radiocarpal arthritis? Well, obviously, we have conservative management. We have splint therapy analgesia. We could consider denervation, which has some pretty good results. Um, arthrodesis is an important one, and you can consider a total arthrodesis, or would you go for more partial arthrodesis? And of course, we have various forms of arthroplasty, either a, a, a resurfacing type of arthroplasty or a full-blown arthroplasty. But what I'd like to explore with you this afternoon or this evening for you guys is the concept of a partial arthrodesis and scaphoidectomy and the advantages of performing such a surgical procedure for the patient and his motion or her motion. This is not a new concept. In fact, the Austrians and Germans had popularized this a long time ago, the so-called radioscaphal lunate fusion. They did a lot of cadaveric experimental work where they fused the radius, the scaphoid and the lunate, and they had pretty good results. Unfortunately, what happens when you fuse the radioscaphal lunate areas, you block radial deviation. So I just want you to look at this diagram that Naji and Buchler came out with. There's completely no radial deviation possible when you fuse the joint in such a partial fashion. These sketches I owe tribute to Mark Garcia who, who scanned these for me. Now, that was a cadaveric experiment that was performed by Naji and Butchler, but on a more in vivo and patient-related um, series, they fused the radioscaphal lunate area and found that um, with radiological progression, 12% ended up with painful mid-carpal arthritis when leaving the distal scaphoid. Asymptomatic uh, arthritis was observed on the x-rays in long-term follow-up, uh, but it's obvious that you do get a knock-on effect if you just fuse the radioscaphal lunate complex. What's important, and I'd like everybody in the audience, if they have the ability right now, is to raise your hand. And I'd even invite the panels uh, of experts today to raise up your hand and pretend you're holding a hammer. Hold up a hammer, Daniel. I know you're not holding it up there, but just pretend you're holding a hammer there and try to pretend you're hammering a nail into a wall. It's very difficult. The functional position of the hand is actually going from radial deviation and extension to flexion and palmar deviation. That is the most useful function to us as humans when we are trying to work in any form of, um, of activity. And that is called the dart throwing motion, which is purely carpal. So taking us back to those experiments that Naji and Butchler uh, published on, we can see to enable us to get that kind of mid carpal motion uh, slide here, I'd like you to note the radial deviation. We need approximately 20 degrees of radial deviation in order to start that arc for us to use that hammer. If you've blocked it, you can't pull back your wrist, you won't be able to hammer, you won't be able to get the nail into the wall. So just bear that concept in your mind of that mid-carpal motion. So what was then popularized is the partial fusion is an option. However, take away the scaphoid distal pole. 
We've just been trying to save it uh, and forgive me the scaphoid uh, salvage operations we've just seen. I'm advocating removing this completely different pathology, but to free up that mid carpal motion. And in doing so, you get radial deviation as well as Alden deviation. You've in essence, physiologically unblocked mid carpal motion. Going back to the case history A, uh, the uh, scan is there, the, the spanning X fixator is there with the multiple KYs. I think they did a reasonable job. But if you look on the most uh, lateral x-ray that we have here, you can see that there is a carpal instability. It's most likely static at this stage, but there's an obvious rotatory abnormality of the lunate bone, and that's leading to progressive accelerated arthritis. However, mid-carpal is spared on this x-ray. Opening this uh, patient's wrist up from a dorsal approach with a, uh, a burger-type flap, because you're going to try and improve the, uh, the function post-operatively, and you can use simple KYs. You can use plates. You can use scaphoid screws. They're quite expensive. KYs are cheap and cheerful, as we like to call them. And you do accomplish what you need. Taking away the scaphoid, you can use as a graft, and you can interpose that between the lunate and your scaphoid bone. Forgive these KYs. They're not penetrating the median nerve, although they look like they are. This is how it would look in a more long-term follow-up. And this patient... Um, if you can see at the bottom, radial deviation arc is 40 degrees. So you're well within that physiological requirement to enable you to, uh, to, to get that dart in or to get that nail into the wall, as you can be observed here from the extension and the flexion of the uh, wrist. As 70 months follow up, uh, again, I'm stressing the radial deviation there, 20 degrees. So we've obeyed that arc that is required and uh, a, a pretty good consolidation of your fusion. The case B with the um, uh, scaphoid uh, fossa fracture isolated there with progressive arthritis, once again, KY fixation and a radial deviation of 10 degrees, uh, but uh, again, good mid carpal motion. This is an interesting case of a patient who was fused, but they left the scaphoid pole in. And after six months, roughly, painful arthritis settled in at the uh, ST joint, which you can be observed on the, uh, the x-ray here. So what we did was take away the scaphoid pole, free it up, and uh, this frees up the mid-carpal motion. Note the sparing, once again, of the mid-carpal cartilage and the, uh, on the x-ray here. So this study, which we showed uh, that uh, compared to some of the previous studies, we had a good radial deviation unlocking that mid-carpal motion and an improved satisfaction, which I haven't showed up here, but good grip strengths. So the take-home messages here for the audience, uh, please, is to try and consider when you have an isolated radiocarpal arthritis with sparing of the mid-carpal joint space, this physiological mid-carpal dart throwing motion. It would allow those patients to move their wrists uh, in their daily activity and you don't have to consider a total fusion. And it gives them this kind of range of motion required with strength to perform what they need to be doing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Zulfi. I hand over Dr. Vikas. Dr. Vikas? Dr. Vikas, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Ah, you, uh, we'll have uh, five to seven minutes uh, panel discussion. And I think Dr. Hitesh has raised his hand, so you can involve Dr. Dike Hitesh and please tell the next speaker to... Yeah, Dr. Professor Kotwal, uh, uh, is talking next. Yeah, it's, it's fine. Yeah. In the meanwhile, we'll have a few questions from Dr. Zulfi. Um, uh, yeah. I have one question. It was a nice talk, Dr. Zulfi. Uh, you. Did you encounter proximal migration of trapezium? In one of your cases, there was a proximal migration of trapezium after a distal scaphoidectomy you did. Yes. So does it, uh, is there loss of radial deviation later on? I, uh, it, it's a very good question. Thank you for that question. Uh, what we're doing is we're looking at the long-term follow-up of not only the uh, subluxation or the subsidence of the trapezium, but also of the capitate. We still do not know how much progression we'll get and collapse of the capitate because it's very important. I discussed this with the Australian group at one point and also removed the equitrum to improve the radiological arc as well. Uh, but the long-term radiological implication of 
uh, of this procedure is still ongoing. Uh, uh, Sufi, I was seeing your X-rays. You are not using much of hardware. What is your? What are your views? On I've now I've now changed from simple K wires to. Uh, we have some pretty cool plates out there with radio scape for lunar fusion, um, and they allow a a good uh, solid capture of both the bones. But you can use any volop dorsal uh, plate. Uh, that you, you have for distal radial fracture treatment, and you can use that as a means to achieve your orthodesis. But bear in mind, if you're going through a dorsal approach, you'll have your extensors there, you'll have a lot of impingement. And uh, you know if you've run out of cash, as we have on the NHS, KYs work well. Okay. Uh, what are your views about spider plate, that hub plate? Uh, I've used that for four corners. My, my objections about the spider hub is, uh, in my in my experience, you have I've had some dorsal impingement on the rim of the yeah. radius, um, and also you're specifically here trying to capture the radius, the scaphoid, and the lunate. And I think uh, getting a circular plate there is anatomically slightly more difficult than using a a T plate or even percutaneous screws uh, that the type that we have. I don't know if you use the hub for this particular type of fusion no, no, yourself. No, uh, only for four corner fusion, but still we find that hub takes away a lot of bone. Otherwise, Absolutely. it impinges. It takes away a lot of bone. Yeah, Anil, Anil would, would like to answer, ask questions. Uh, <clears throat> so it'll be great talk. What, what's your bailout option if there is a non-union? It's a good question. Pseudarthrosis or any of these things, yeah. It's a good question, and uh, I still think that this is a bridge to the eventual, this particular procedure. Uh, my suspicion is that all of these patients will eventually get mid-carpal arthritis. Whether it's symptomatic or not, we don't know. So the answer is initially, if it's asymptomatic, I'll leave them alone. Uh, however, if it becomes symptomatic arthritis and the, uh, and, 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 uh, the non-union hasn't taken place, has taken place, uh, you could go back in, try it again, the chances are that your capitate has already dipped into that gap and you're gonna to have to end up going into either resurfacing, proximal carpectomy, still whatever's left, or a total fusion. Can I ask you a question, uh, Dr. Julfi? Once you fix it with K-wires, uh, do you get a, give a cast after that? And for how long? Absolutely. I think, you again, these patients are young adults. They're pretty much the same stereotype as the scaphoid uh, um, pathology uh, population. So you, you can't trust them. I would say six weeks of a, a um, below elbow splint is the minimum and then take out the wires. I bury the wires because I, I'm always cautious of infection there. And um, hopefully that's enough time to consider pulling them out. Does it hamper the mobilization? You need to give a gas for six weeks, six to eight weeks maybe? Excellent question. And at the moment, we're looking at isolated casting that frees the mid carpal motion only. Uh, so we can get some fantastic thermoplastic splints manufactured that allow us to actually move the mid carpus while you're still immobilizing the uh, radiocarpal joint, which you've transfixed. That's great. Yeah, Tahir wants to ask something. Yeah. yeah. Dr. Zulfi, very nice presentation. And uh, Albert, Luke, and uh, Garcia, they are very nice teachers. I work with them. And it's a very nice procedure. I have used this procedure uh, when some patients when they present late around eight months, nine months of this intraarterial studious fracture. Uh, we'd like to give a little bit of tip about the uh, resection of distal scaphoid because uh, that's a little bit difficult thing. Even if we do scaphoidectomy, then distal part is difficult to remove and the radius capo capitate ligament is always at risk. We have to save that ligament. So what special techniques do you use to resect the display scaphoid? It's um, again, a very good question. I, it is a very difficult access down into the uh, distal pole. Uh, you have two options. Uh, you can go make a separate volar incision, which I sometimes do for a uh, scaphoidectomy uh, because that enables you to take out the distal pole much more easier, but obviously it obviates a extra incision. Uh, be careful that you don't abuse the volar structures, the volar ligamentous structures that you were ki kindly pointing out because that does destabilize the, uh, the wrist some, uh, somewhat. 
what I usually do is I fix the 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 area, the radio scaphoid lunate area with wires, so it stabilizes the scaphoid. That gives you a good option to get your osteotome or your or your um, or your uh, saw blade into a non-floating scaphoid because that's the difficulty when you have a floating scaphoid and you're trying to resect the distal pole. It, it always pushes away. I'm sure you've had that experience. So if you can try and fix it with the radio scaphoid wire first and then take out the distal pole, that helps stabilize that. Yeah. That uh, Professor Kotwal wants to ask. Uh, Professor Kotwal and, and Dr. Vineet. Yeah, yeah. I think Dr. Vineet has been waiting for a long time. Dr. Vineet, would you like to ask? Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Zulfi, for a nice presentation. I just want to know whether whether all the activity of daily living, like including writing, which is a very essential part of our day-to-day -day activity, is already possible after this procedure? Or do we have any difficulty in doing this uh, writing and other things after this procedure in youngsters especially? I, th I think personally the pain uh, alleviation of this procedure is significantly improved on all of our um, in all of our subjects that we we looked at. The actual um, you know thumb pinch holding holding the pen wasn't affected in the immediate post-operative period. So it's an immediate uh, uh, it's an immediate activity that they can resume. My main benefit using this procedure, I traditionally fused all of these wrists or I would perform a proximal carpectomy. But my um, main benefit I've seen is the mid-carpal motion is maintained. And that is for the manual laborer who has this kind of a fracture. It's usually the manual laborers. They wanna continue working and they don't want a fused wrist. And it's the freeing up of that motion that has convinced me uh, that this is perhaps a bridge that we can use. But the pen writing happens pretty quick. And Dr. Vikas, uh, 15 yeah. minutes are Professor remaining. Professor Kotal wants to ask something. Uh, yeah, yeah, after. Quick question. Uh, Dr. Uh, Zulfi, very nice talk. Uh, have you used this procedure in uh, chronic uh, scaphoid instability with radiocarpal arthritis? Yes, I've used this uh, in uh, for all kinds of radiocarpal arthritis, whatever the etiology has been. Uh, the main contraindication is if you have mid-carpal arthritis. So in essence, if you have an instability of the proximal row, you're stabilizing it by this. Um, and it's the instability that's caused the arthritis. So you're kind of killing two birds with one stone here, in my opinion. Thank you. Yeah, Dr. Hitesh would uh, like to ask, like, what is the best procedure for snack wrist? Hitesh, that was your question. Sorry, snack, S-N? Yeah, yeah. Snack yes, to the arthrosis. What is the best? Sca what is the opinion of the house? non-union advanced collapse. Like arthritis what, after. St what stage are we at here? What stage snack are we yeah, talking? Hitesh. We're radiocarpal arthrosis. So if we're talking a stage one radio scaphoid, isolated radio scaphoid. Um, that will dictate my approach here. Um, and if you've got isolated radio scaphoid, I'm very, I'm very um, conservative. I often try to give them a uh, guided injection with, uh, with uh, steroid or uh, pain relief. Otherwise, a very simple, very minimalistic styloidectomy uh, at that stage. Uh, but I'll, I'm, I'm open to suggestions. Yeah, Dr. Kotwal, is your talk ready? Like, can we? Yeah, start yeah. I'll, I'll uh, yeah. share the screen now. Sure. Yeah, there you go. So I would like to thank DOA, Dr. Sharad Agrawal, Vikas Gupta, Manish Dhawan for giving me an opportunity to, be, to participate in this webinar and will speak on the uh, DRUJ salvage options. Uh, the salvage options can be uh, ulnar shortening. Actually, I'll quickly go to this topic because of the shortage of time, you know, just eight minutes. So I thought I'll not uh, talk about the investigation procedures and so on and so forth. 
So the salvage options can be ulnar shortening, direct procedure, hemi reception uh, of the distal ulna, wafer procedure, Sawe Kapenji procedure, uh, distal ulnar replacement, and of course the total DRUJ replacement. The ulnar shortening osteotomy is actually for uh, an obviously an uh, ulnar, ulnar positive uh, deformity and uh, where it is causing impingement. So you can definitely do a shortening and it is better than doing a direct procedure. We'll come to that as well. And of course, there are now various plates are available, which can actually be uh, low profile and you can go up to the distal as well. So the incision also can be uh, shorter in that. Or talking about direct procedure, the, that has used to be a very common procedure done un, until many years ago. But I mean, uh, this is now not considered as a very good, uh, very good operation. And somebody did uh, for this kind of the, the DRUJ instability, did a, a direct procedure. And the, this is actually, as I said, is not considered as a good procedure because the distal ulnar stump instability that it causes and the incidence is quite high, about 8 to 50% or so. And it says that the disability is, or the instability is more in younger patients. And therefore it requires uh, a stump stabilization of the distal ulna and uh, not recommended obviously in younger patients. Maybe the perhaps the only indication can be in older patients with uh, rheumatoid arthritis. And you require for a stabilization, you can use the tendon, half tendon of uh, ECU or FC, FCU and you can make hole into the, into the ulna and uh, try to stabilize it with the help of the, uh, with the tendon graft that you are taking half of it. So this is it, uh, a stabilization done. And this is this, the hole that you can see. And then this is more or less uh, stable and the patient is uh, asymptomatic. So the direct procedure alone, removing the distal end of ulna is not considered as good as I said. Then you can have an uh, ulnar radial impingement and this can be painful, and uh, therefore you can do a hemi-resection interposition. That means you will excise only that much part of the, of the ulna and uh, put in uh, a spacer, which can be in fact a tendon uh, graft also, a free tendon graft. You take a roll of, make a roll of it, and uh, this is how it can be that you excise a part of the, of the ulna so that the impingement uh, is relieved, and you put in a a spacer graft uh, of a tendon graft itself. Then a wafer resection for a very slight uh, ulnar positive, and if it is causing impingement there, then you can take a very small subchondral uh, wafer shepherd bone and uh, just suture it back. It doesn't require any implant, and even the mobilization can be early, and this definitely uh, relieves the symptoms because you have. Uh, decrease the length of the, of the ulna. The, in cases where there is uh, DRUJ instability, you can see here the instability here, plus uh, the uh, degenerative changes into the uh, sigmoid notch, and the CT scan shows definite degenerative changes in the, in the sigmoid notch. The patient is definitely symptomatic, and uh, there, uh, you need to do a procedure which gives generally good results. That's the Sao Kapenji procedure. What you do is you kind of uh, denude this articular surfaces here, fix it, and uh, create a gap of about a centimeter or so. And uh, this gives uh, good mobility of rotation in the forearm. And also, uh, this distal stump has to be again uh, stabilized. Either you can see, you know, stabilized with the help of a tendon nearby either FCU or ECU, or you can even use the uh, pronator coordinators to stabilize the distal end. And uh, this is one of our older patients. The surgery was done in 2008, and uh, this is about 12 year follow-up. Recently, he came for some other problem, and uh, that's the range of movement and the function that he has. And you can see here a very well healed uh, scar and a very good function. Then you have this uh, orthoplasty. Uh, this is the uh, distal ulnar resection orthoplasty. And uh, of course, the availability of this is, is a problem here. Although we still had some one case, I think I must have done it with Vikas when he was at Ames. And uh, 
this actually of course uh, didn't work too well and the patient developed pain and it was not uh, kind of this thing uh, very successful but then obviously we had no other bailout option and we had to remove this and resort to kind of a, a direct kind of procedure this is the total uh, DRUJ replacement. Uh, this is the Shekers uh, modification, Shekers module for this. Of course, we don't have it, but this I think should be uh, working as, as a better uh, implant as compared to just the distal ulnar uh, uh, prosthesis. Now I will share a, a short video of the procedure, uh, the Savakapanji procedure, and this shows the uh, the instability at the DRUJ, you can see here uh, that the, this, they were definitely dislocated, subluxed uh, distal ulna. Make a uh, straight incision on the ulna side, right over the uh, stolite and extending proximally. That's the distal ulna. You can stabilize it passing two guide wires. Take a one centimeter width of bone proximal to the uh, neck of the sort of uh, ulna, just proximal to the starlight. This is, we are approaching into the sigmoid notch. Denuding the articular surface. Similarly, on the other side, the distal articular surface from the, from the radius will also be denuded. So that you can achieve a good fusion. After having stabilized the distal fragment, you make, in, make a cut, bring those fragments close to each other. Better to put two screws and you can, you can change the diameter of the screws because if there is not that much of room, Complete the osteotomy, take away that uh, piece of bone. This can be used as uh, some grafts to put in. This is the stabilization with half tendon, FCU. Make a hole into the and suture it with itself. As I said, you can take uh, some cancellous part from the, if you can get, as an additional bone graft. However, if you're the uh, cortical denudation has been good, then generally it doesn't require graft as well, but still, if you want, you can use uh, a few pieces of uh, bone as graft. Like to check the rotation and the, and the stability. This is uh, again. 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 Uh, again. Good function. I would like, before I end my talk, I'd like to thank uh, Vikas, Bhavuk and Tahir, who must have been with me there uh, while we were at Ames and they definitely have contributed towards many cases.
So to conclude, the DRUJ uh, DR injuries are common because of the uh, distal radius fractures and the other such injuries in, in that area. However, if they are treated adequately in the acute stage, then that can prevent the chronicity. But otherwise, uh, you can definitely identify the correct procedure and uh, treat it accordingly. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, Dr. Vikas, uh, we have 35 minutes. And over to you for panel discussion. Dr. Vikas? We'll have questions. Uh, yeah. We'll have questions. I'll yeah. ask Ajit to, Ajit to share his screen. Uh, sir, can you uh, stop? Share? Yeah. So, any questions? Uh, in the meanwhile, Ajit uh, shares his screen. Any questions for regarding DREJ? Yeah. Dr. I, Sharad. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Putwal. Very uh, informative talk. Uh, my just one query uh, Derek's versus Kapanji procedure. In mm. both, we have to stabilize the uh, proximal fragment. And uh, Kapanji procedure being, you do something extra, so likely to have more complications. So what extra advantage you get out of it? See, directs you are removing the distal end of the ulna completely, right? right. So you are taking away all other uh, ligaments and the other uh, tissues. That, that, that in any case, that in any case, you stabilize by uh, sutures and other no, things. Then you are stabilizing only the distal end of the proximal fragment, the ulna. There right. is no distal fragment of the ulna. Whereas in uh, Savakapanji, you have the distal uh, end of the ulna, you have the stylad process, you have those ligaments, TFCC, and whatever I mean that way for that matter. And uh, the distal, the proximal, uh, sorry, the distal end of the proximal ulna, that is also has to be stabilized because that is otherwise be floating. But you definitely, there is a lot of difference between. As I told you, there is no distal frag fragment in the direct procedure. And that has actually led to many other complications of that. If it is not stabilized, it can cause impingement between the ulna and radius, between, uh, uh, between the, uh, that is the more commonest thing, the ulna and the radius impingement. Any questions from uh, panel or uh, from the audience? Dr. Manish, is there any questions from the audience? Any other talk before we go to Ajit's talk? No, not at present. Hello, hello. Can, can, I, can I ask yeah. Dr. Manish? Yeah. yeah, yeah Dr. Sure. Manish? Yes. Yes. Uh, Dr. Kotwal, thanks for a nice presentation. I just want to know whether these procedures are can be done in the acute DRUG injuries also, or should we wait to, for them for their quantity? Only if it is uh, uh, being taken care only after six weeks or uh, eight weeks' time. No, the actually acute DRUJ injury should be treated properly. These are basically salvage procedures, what I talked about. These are the ones when actually the problem becomes chronic. And, you know, there has been like I've shown examples where the ulna is long or where there is instability, there is gap between ulna and radius, there is degenerative changes which has developed in the sigmoid notch. So these are actually the procedures for chronic things. For an acute uh, DRUJ injury, they are best treated. Uh, then itself, and they are sometimes associated with uh, even the fracture of the distal radius as well. And all you can do is to uh, stabilize it, reduce it with the forearm and supination, and at the most put a K wire across the uh, radius and ulna and uh, splint it or, or cast it for about four weeks or so. This will generally heal uh, quite well. So the acute ones should be treated uh, right then and then. Yeah, so, Dr. what do you call the acute one? What, what do you call the acute one? Like it's a, up to the six weeks or three months. Is there any time period we should treat them not exact, as an acute? Not exact time period, but up to about three weeks or four weeks, you can still uh, treat them uh, properly. Okay. Thank you very much. Dr. Hitesh, yeah, your question, please. Talk. It was a very nice talk. I have one question. Does it matter if we fix this uh, distal piece in supination or pronation? Um, no, in, in Saka Panji. No, yeah. I'm not asking the question. In Saka Panji. Yeah, in Saka Panji. No, the actually this uh, the supination pronation would not be there because now you have created a gap between uh, between the in the ulna. So now that movement will be taking place in that gap, that one centimeter gap that you have created. So that will be the ulna distal ulna will be fixed in in its in, in its normal anatomical position itself. 
you're not you are you will not be rotating that fragment and for you sir what is the best clinical test for this druj injuries diagnosing druj injuries um actually there would be instability druj instability in the sense that there are many tests you know um, the piano key sign and uh, all those tests which will actually create uh, pain when you are doing uh, those movements maneuvers and uh, even try to compress uh, this thing the hand to the to the wrist or to the ulna that this will create uh, pain uh, i mean you pain to the patient otherwise then you will have to do test in terms of doing a ct scan or an mri scan which like i showed in the ct scan that that the ulna was subluxed dorsally so that would actually be obvious uh, in a ct scan or an mri scan so if there are no questions uh, sure Does, can, he, can i yeah 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 sorry i, I uh, anil, anil yeah I just wanted to uh, clarify with vinit uh, when he meant acute druj so it's a spectrum as sir was telling uh, up to salvage procedure but when you have something acute like with the distal radius fracture we some as sir said we mobilize but the basic problem there is the ligament uh, injuries the especially the tfcc injuries so when we look at these patients at about 3 months when they come back and if there is instability there you need to check the status of tfcc and then if required you need to go in for a tfcc repair now patients can come even at 6 months but there is no arthritis which means it doesn't require a salvage then we do a ligament reconstruction in terms of adam burgess kind of procedure with a graft from the fcr or or palmer is longer than one of these things so it's basically a spectrum starting with acute and you know it goes on to something like a, a chronic thing and then it becomes arthritic and salvageable and that's what the risk goes so keyword is arthritis thank you boss is, thank you boss for yeah. okay. south appendix the keyword is arthritis in the sigmoid notch so uh, i'll ask ajit uh, ajit are you ready with the presentation yeah. yeah yeah i'm ready so he'll be talking about fingertip injuries yes just a minute okay dr sadeep start the video is there yeah good evening everybody uh, are you able to listen me yeah you are audible yeah thank you so much i'm i'm really obliged and uh, uh thank you very much to dr vikas sir and all the office bearer of uh, delhi orthopedic association so i'm going to talk on the fingertip injury these kind of injuries are very common injuries and almost um, i think uh, almost all orthopedic surgeons can uh, they encounter these kind of injuries in their clinic it can because it can happen in the workplace it can happen to road as a road traffic accident it can happen uh, when you are in the at home uh during chopping some uh, something some vegetables some fruits so these kind of injuries are very common the reason behind is that because the hand and the fingers they are the part of the body which are most exposed to the surroundings and the most exposed to the exterior when you encounter any kind of injury the first thing which come in contact is the fingers and the hand so if i'll uh so uh if I, i if i define the fingertip injuries it's basically uh, the fingertip is the part of the finger which is distal to the insertion of the flexor and extensor tendon is considered as a fingertip there are various classification of the fingertip amputations so uh, if you if you'll see that the part of the fingertip basically there are three components nail pulp and bone so if the if there is a close injury of the nail happens there will be formation of the subangual hematoma if there is open injury there will be laceration of the nail sometimes you'll encounter that the patient has a loss of the nail nail bed and sometimes there is a avulsion of the germinal matrix so the, the, the that is kind of the avulsion injuries the pulp injuries it can happen two types once the bone is not exposed i mean that when there there's a loss of the soft tissue only and the second is when the patient has exposed to bone so subangual hematoma this is basically a very painful conditions where the patient has a, a collection of the uh, this nail bed injury happens under the nail plate and there is a collection of the blood in between the nail plate and the nail bed and this is very painful conditions 
initially uh, it was uh, in the, there was a concept of the, the when we should go for the trip finishing and when we should go for the uh, repair of the nail bed so there was a consensus where the when the 25 to 50% of the uh, subungual hematoma is there i mean the hematoma, hematoma size is there is if 25 to 50% we should go for the trip finishing and if it is more than 50% we should go for the uh, removal of the nail plate and the nail bed repair. But the recent consensus what says that, what the recent literature says that the, it is the size of the hematoma is immaterial. What is important is that the nail plate should nail plate should not be avulsed. If the nail plate is intact, we should go for the trephinations. So trephination is basically a procedure which should be done under the digital block and full sterile precautions. We, you can use the 18 gauge needle or you can use uh, electrocautery to make a small hole in the nail plate. And the, once the blood is evacuated from the, uh, un, uh, from the nail plate, uh, the patient becomes absolutely pain-free. So uh, nail bed lacerations, uh, the two things are very important for the nail bed lacerations. If patient has nail bed laceration, you should go for the repair. And be, before that, there should be thorough debridement of the nail bed, and it should be repaired with the low caliber absorbable sutures like a 50 mm -hmm. uh, chromic catgut or 60 chromic catgut or the rapid vacuum you can use for the repair of the nail bed. And the most important thing we should remember for the repair of the nail bed is that there should not be very tight sutures. Sutures should be very uh, loose sutures so that uh, healing will happen and uh, uh, it will heal faster. And other thing is that the once the patient has compromised vasculature over the pulp, we should not use one zero sutures or two zero sutures or one or two zero etalon. Low caliber sutures, loose sutures, they are the very useful, especially for the kids. And it's important to put the nail plate uh, so that uh, uh, he, uh, so that the na new nail will come easily. Once the patient has loss of the nail bed, we should go for the split thickness nail bed graft. You can harvest this from the uh, great toe or you can harvest from the thumb and you can put it there and uh, uh, cover with the flap. Can we use the part of the nail which is amputated? Yes, we, we can use the part of the nail and uh, for, uh, from the amputated part and we can put the uh, flap cover and the finger can be. What happens when the patient has nail matrix avulsion? There's a there's avulsion of the germinal matrix and it, it most commonly it is associated when the pa in pediatric patients when they have epiphyseal injury and the same or fracture is there. So the idea is that we should replace the matrix under the nail fold and we should put the pull through sutures and repair it. This is this is a patient where the nail plate avul nail bed avulsion is there, nail bed injury is there. So it is uh, repaired with the pull through sutures and the nail bed was repaired. So what happened with the pulp injury happens? The pulp injury is basically the three kind of uh, amputation can happen with the pulp. One is the transverse amputation, and there's the dorsal oblique amputation and the volar oblique amputations. So what 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 kind of the flap is important? There, there are various flaps which we can do for these kind of amputations. Today, I'm not going to talk all the flaps. Today, I'm going to talk only those kind of flaps which all the orthopedic surgeons can do easily in a small setup also where we do not need microscope, we do not need very expertise, you do not need very expert assistant for the helping. So if, because if the patient has transverse amputation, you can do the VY flap is the most easiest flap you can do. Though there are options that you can do the oblique triangular flap, you can do the homodistal neurovascular island flap. But if uh, the most simpler flap and most safest flap is the VY flap for the transverse amputation. If the patient has dorsal oblique amputation, you can do the VY flap, but VY flap cannot be done if the patient has polar oblique amputation. In these kind of a defect, we should go for the cross finger flap and thinner flaps. So this, uh, if, if the patient has loss of the pulp without exposing the bone, if the bone is covered and the loss of the pulp is there, only the soft tissue loss is there. What a regular dressing and the secondary intention, healing by the secondary intention, I think the best possible option because the, the, the problem with these kind of treatment is that the patient has, uh, you know, that they, it takes longer time, like three to four weeks to heal. But the wonderful thing is that this patient has normal two-point discrimination in the sensations. 
And this kind of sensation cannot be achieved by the, any kind of the flap options, flap treatments. So if patient has exposed bone, we should go for the VY flap cover or the, the patient has dorsal oblique amputations. The important thing regarding the VY flap is that the, this is the triangle of the unit, you know, the, the base of the triangle of the VY flap is over the defect. And the base is as wide as the uh, both side of the uh, nail fold. It should not be larger or this, it should not be smaller than the, than the nail folds. And the apex of the triangle should be proximal, should be at the flexure crease. It should not cross the flexure crease of the DIP join. The maximum advancement what we can get at uh, V by flap is one centimeter, but five to seven centimeter is uh, five to seven millimeter is easily can achieve. The other option for the uh, transverse amputation is that the cutler V by flap. This flap. The problem with this flap is that it cannot be mobilized at the normal VY flap we can do. So uh, this is a, a case of the patient has transverse amputation and VY flap was done. The next option is the cross finger flap. When the patient has a volar oblique amputation and there's a defect or the finger on the volar side of the finger where the tendons are exposed or the bone is exposed, we can do the V cross finger flaps. The vascularity of the cross finger flap which is harvested, it comes from this uh, dorsal skin vessels, which has come from the volar or uh, distal arteries. The dorsal vessels come on the dorsally and they give supply to the, this part of the skin. Important thing is that once you, uh, uh, I mean, that measure the defect, how much uh, defect is there, make a template, then uh, mark over the finger and you cut the uh, clean and ligament so that the flap can move easily and you can cover the defect properly. This is a patient, uh, this is a, I mean, that this was a child of around seven, eight years old. He has electric burn injury. There's an exposed flexure tendon of uh, in, uh, index finger and the little finger. It, it was, and, the, uh, and the, there's a wound on the ring finger and the middle finger, though the critical structures was not exposed. So we choose option of putting the skin graft over the middle finger and ring finger, and the index and uh, little finger was covered with the cross finger flap. Thinner flap is also a good option. This is kind of random pattern flap uh, to cover the whole uh, oblique defect. So the design of the flap should be at the near the MP joint, near the MP joint and avoid the mid palmar area. It should not be on this area. And the important thing is that it should be in the thinner area. It should not be proximally because the once the you'll harvest from this area, the patient, the patient will develop the first web space contracture. The bony injury is basically the tough fracture. This is this kind of tough, tough fracture is always associated with the nail bed injuries. So important thing is that once you repair the nail bed, they, they certainly don't uh, need uh, stabilization by the putting the wires or any kind of bony fixation is required. So I just want to summarize that do not put tight sutures for the nail bed repairs. Don't put tight sutures for the pulp, especially in the children, because there's vascularity is compromised. And if you use high caliber sutures like one zero or two zero, I mean that the pulp will go, it will not survive. So the, use the lesser caliber sutures, splinting, scar massage, and desensitization is important. There's a small video for the VY flap cover is that this is patient has a transverse amputation. I mean, this is cadaveric uh, videograph, whereas the patient has transverse amputation. The important thing is that the marking is that the uh, base should be at the defect side and it should be the triangle apex should be at the flexure crease. So once you uh, take, uh, once you have taken the incision, important thing is that you should cut the fibrous septa and the section should be from the distal to the proximal and uh, you should uh, go uh, above to the periosteum and elevate the flap and on the both side of the flap, you will see that you should cut the fibrous you should cut the fibrous septa because these, uh, these fibrous septa, they attach the subcutaneous tissue with the bone and you should dissect it properly so that because it will not cut these fibrous septa, the flap will not mobilize. To mobilization, this is very important. And once the flap is mobilized and covered that, if, it's not necessary that you, you should always close the Y limb of the flap you just put few sutures inside the uh, base of the flap with the nail bit, and then uh, there's no need to put the sutures at the apex.
So I think uh, this is the flap which is mobilized completely. And this is done. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Ajit. Uh, Dr. Vikas. Dr. Vikas. Dr. Vikas, can you hear me? Yeah. Dr. Vikas, Dr. there are two questions from the audience. Yeah. In the meantime, I'll, I'll ask Tahir to uh, share the screen and we'll ask questions. Yeah. yeah. So there are yeah. two questions from the audience. One is that during percutaneous trans uh, trapezoid wire insertion, how do you take measurement accurately? The question question is towards me, me because I raised that thing. See, for me, waist fractures, the measurement is female patient 20 mm and uh, male patient 22, or it could be because you don't have to be very accurate in waist fractures. Uh, that's a thing. And uh, usually, uh, the trans trapezoid is only biomechanically much better because it accesses towards center. But uh, in clinical practice, uh, trans uh, uh, trapezoid and uh, going through the scapular tubercle, the clinical results are same. Uh, Dr. Uh, Vikas, the question for Professor Kothwal. Uh, options to treat DRUJ instability in acute conditions? Yeah, I said that also in acute, actually, if it is really acute, I mean, just the fresh that the patient has had uh, a fractured distal radius or some DRUJ injury, then you can uh, uh, stabilize it in uh, the forearm in supination and uh, generally it doesn't require any ligamentous repair or uh, other procedures. You can even put a, uh, stabilize it uh, by a K wire between the ulna and the radius and keep it on for about four weeks and this would generally heal in that much, uh, in that much period. Otherwise, if there is a gross instability and then the, the MRI uh, studies can show about the uh, ligamentous injuries and they can be repaired and of course if it is gone that beyond three to four weeks of time and there is an instability then obviously you can do a ligament uh, sorry a tendon uh -huh. reconstruction as you know said by Anil as well so then you can go in and uh, take the tendons uh, the surrounding tendons either the FCR or the ECU uh, and uh, FC FCU or the ECU and try to reconstruct and the procedure, the principle for that doing that is that the ulna, which is subluxed in, in, and not in relation with the sigmoid notch of the radius, you try to bring it in that position and use the tendons in such a way that uh, it is uh, stays in that position. Then the best procedure or the commonly used procedure is the Adams procedure, where you kind of rotate the tendon uh, around the neck of the ulna and pass it through the uh, distal radius just by the side of the sigmoid notch. So this is how you will stabilize it uh, in, in relation with the, with the radius. Okay, uh, Doctor, uh, if there are no questions, should I ask Dr. Tahir to? Yeah, yeah, sure, because we have yeah. 15 minutes now. Yeah. Uh, Good Tahir evening, everybody. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm highly thankful to Dr. Vikas, Dr. Manish for this opportunity. It's uh, very important and the learning set from everybody. And trigger finger is considered one of the important things because uh, according to the uh, American Association of Head Surgeons, it's mandatory to train the residents also for this procedure. So it becomes very important for residents to how to do it and uh, how uh, we should know everything about it, basically. So it happens in a healthy middle age, around uh, 40 or 50 years. And it's more common in females, so it's two to six times more common in females. Sometimes it involves multiple fingers and thumb is the most common uh, trigger digit and the uh, index finger is the least common trigger digit. And uh, we have to know about the secondary trigger finger. Uh, they usually involve the multiple fingers, especially the diabetes mellitus or the arthritis. Dr. Because... Tahir, can I interrupt? Yeah. yeah please share the screen. Your voice is not that much clear. Please speak okay. a little bit louder. You can yeah. come near, uh, near your computer. Tahir, you can come just near, the, yeah. near to the mic, actually. Yeah, yeah. That's, that, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it's, we have to Better. vary of the, we should do the uh, secondary trigger trigger. Uh, especially uh, it happens in diabetes, mellitus, rheumatoid arthritis, or gout, 
or other rheumatic problems, renal disease, amyloidosis, sarcoidosis. It's important to rule out these things because these carry worse prognosis. Whatever treatment modality you choose, whether it's operative or conservative, the prognosis in secondary to the finger is uh, worse, basically. So we should be wary about this secondary trigger finger. These are usually multiple digits involved, and you will have a tenosynovitis element in these uh, secondary trigger finger. You should know the grade. It's uh, grade one, two, three, A, three, B, and four. One is basically just the pain which is happening around the volar aspect of the finger and retaining sheath. And grade two, where you have a, uh, you can see the catching and patient can extend the finger uh, actively. And grade three A is when the catching. There's passive extension, but there's no active extension. In grade three B is when there's no active flexion. The, the digit is uh, logged in extension. In grade four is, uh, which is uh, with the, the digit is involved in flexion. But we have to uh, do a few things that there's no association between the grade and the injection therapy. And the higher the grade, uh, the patient wants uh, a quick and one-time solution. So. If, if somebody is coming grade four, uh, they will uh, look out for surgery. And somebody who is in grade two or grade one, uh, they will look out for conservative treatment, grade three A also. So these are, this is important to know the grades basically. Now how to manage uh, these trigger digits? Uh, we, we, we have different keys for different locks. And similarly, we cannot have one treatment for every digit. So we have to know different digits and should offer every kind of treatment to our patients. So we have splints, rest in local therapy, which comes under conservative treatment. Then local steroid injections, it may be USC guided and blind. At Institute, we usually do nowadays USC guided. And we can do percutaneous release, which can be USC guided or blind, or we can do open release. So these are the options which are available to us. And why conservative? When I go to conferences, and uh, I see a few surgeons advocating directly the operative treatment. And here I am discussing about the conservative treatment. So it's just like I'm taking a few more books, basically. But it's important it's written in the books, and we should uh, know how to do it, basically. And Uh, there's a difference because the conservative treatment uh, is long period of time. Operative treatment is straightforward. Conservative treatment is unreliable. It works in around 30, 25, 30 percent of the cases. Operative treatment is highly effective. Conservative treatment patient has to come every day to for physiotherapy for wax, for ultrasonic, or transsexual massage. So it's expensive, and uh, operative treatment is a short duration of treatment. But with operative treatment comes a small risk, which is seven to nine percent. But uh, the risk is small, but it is definitely there. There are chances of nerve trans transaction, infection, pulley rupture, bow stringing, recurrence, flexion deformity, stiffness, instill pain, RSD. If something is written in the book, then there's always chance it can happen uh, with anyone, basically. So we should be aware of these risks. And there's definite role of conservative treatment. If the, the ideal patient for the injection is when there is solitary finger, discrete palpable nodule, or there is short duration of symptoms. For diabetic patients, they have to be aware there's less chance of go, good outcome with, with uh, steroid injection, uh, but definite results in some patients. There's a risk of transient trial, which uh, takes around three weeks to resolve, and uh, that's why we have to have good glycemic control before injection. So how many injections we can give the first thing comes in mind. So always we have to remember you can give, we can give minimum two injection before going for surgery. For thumb, index finger, middle finger, and ring finger. But for a, a little finger, we can give only one injection because the tendon sheath, there's very small tendon sheath there. Sometimes in 25% of the cases, FDA is lacking. So uh, we were, but don't give more than one injection little finger. There's chance of rupture of the tendon. And how much time is expected before for relief, before we go for surgery? How, what should we counsel the patient? So the effect comes in 10 days to three weeks. So we have to be patient with the, we have to be a little more patient. And uh, uh, how much time to wait for surgical intervention? Uh, we can do around three weeks, but the risk of infection is uh, higher. So for it, 
those cases we have to wait for three months because we have given injection. The local area is immunocompromised, so wait at least for three months of time after giving the injection before going for the surgical treatment. But uh, sometimes we have patients; they simply say no for any injection, no for surgery, and for them, uh, no means no. They don't want any intervention, any kind of operative. Or injection therapy, they just want surgery treatment. Can we offer something to them? So this is a study where they have carried out uh, use the splint, uh, which just covers the DIP joint, the mullet finger splint, and uh, they've used uh, in uh, laborers basically, and they have uh, they have 55 percent success rate. So those patients who are not willing for surgery, and uh, uh, we have we can we can try with splint also and if we see the, what is the most cost effective therapy the most cost effective therapy is one or two injections followed by release in non responding cases so we always should try to uh, go uh, some graded way and there is 25 to 30% less less costly than uh, immediate release so uh, this is what uh, we should try always and if we are uh, Trying for surgery, we can do a percutaneous release. So instead of writing the indication, I am writing here a contraindication because we should not do percutaneous release for thumb and index finger because the neurovascular structures are more volar, more towards the midline. So there's always chances of injury. So don't do this percutaneous release in uh, thumb and index finger. Can do for uh, middle ring and the little finger. This is how we do it basically. Uh, the you see the triggering of the middle digit. The important thing for is always be in the midline. You just check the midline of the uh, at the MCP joint level, and just uh, I'm using a 22 gauge needle and uh, go up to the proximal to the distal crease. And uh, if you know how I'm just holding it, so I'm holding it uh, with, uh, I know around 1.5 centimeter of uh, the needle is inside the palm. So I should, I'm scrapping the A1 pulley. Then I go more proximally, then again the scrap. Then from display, you know, this is all done on the local anesthesia. I'm just scrapping it, the A1 pulley. and. Uh, you will have a gritty sensation and then ask the patient to move the finger. So this is a very simple procedure, but technically you should know how deep you should uh, go. And uh, somebody who has, uh, I've done a little bit of uh, needle epidermotomy for the pain also, so it looks very easy to me. But uh, the main point is be in the midline. So always be in the midline. If you are away from the midline, there's always chance of uh, injury to nerve. If we are planning for uh, trigger figure open surgery, then we must know the incision. So uh, we can do uh, from the longitudinal incision. And uh, for the thumb, we have a transverse incision. And then we can do for fingers a transverse incision also. But we must remember for this thing, the NCP joint for uh, index finger is a little proximal. So you are, if you are doing it with a uh, transfer incision, then be, uh, be careful when you're doing with the index finger, uh, you should not give the incision display. And if you're doing for middle ring a little, then distal palmar piece can be utilized for that. And uh, if you're uh, wary of the radial branch, radial distal nerve of the thumb, then we use a V-shaped incision. Uh, but the point is, uh, don't cross the crease at 90 degree, any risk, any palmar crease. So it's important, you can always use Brunner's incision or uh, modify uh, it, but these are the standard incisions, but don't cross the piece at more than 90 degrees. So this is one of the surgery that I am showing. This is for trigger thumb. Uh, this patient has the triggering. And uh, uh, always, uh, this surgery is always done, uh, I'll advise do under loop. So don't do without loop. We have to be very careful with, with these structures. Uh, and always take safety for the patient. 
and was to give the incision with a soft head the incision should be given with, with a soft head as you're touching your nose without hurting it so just give the incision, skin incision don't go deep use the hooks and then spread spreading this stretch is very important because you initially spread in longitudinal direction you don't directly spread in transverse direction because if you start doing it in transverse direction you will injure the nerve and then to dissect the nerve transverse incision then along the uh, radial side and be along the tendon sheath use the gutters basically and always here also be in the midline the buzzword for trigger thumb surgery any trigger thumb trigger finger is be in midline be in midline be in midline don't uh, go waver this is i am cutting the even fully here you can use uh, sometimes uh, elevator or olive green where you can now i am removing a part of fully and uh, Tenosynovium. You have to be very careful. Don't hurry up. These surgeries are important. Every patient is important. I am removing a part of A1 fully. Then deliver the tendon out. Then look at it distally, and uh, if there is a hyper tenosynovium or hypertrophy, then do tenosynectomy and send a biopsy. and all this is done is in local anesthesia so you can always check with the patient so every patient is different and uh, uh, my take home message is individualize the treatment we cannot uh, open every lock with every key so always uh, give the options to the patient and discuss with the patient if the patient uh, patient is the one who will decide the treatment and cause the treatment the treatment is the first line of management and surgery is safe and one time solution thank you dr vikas over to you thank you dr tahir so any questions to dr tahir in the meanwhile dr vinith we have one short case vinith are you ready yeah. dr sharad yeah yeah tahir uh, uh, salt of steroid do you recommend normally we are using methyl pentisterone like it say uh do you recommend that or particular salt you uh, recommend for local injection uh we also use methyl pentyl acetate basically uh, hydrocortisone <laughs> is a little bit of short duration of uh, if we compare different types of steroids then the longest effect remains of methyl pentyl acetate that's why we use it but definitely you can use the other steroids also And how much how much quantity can a cord can be used uh, cortisone can be used 40 mg is used I What? use a. You have a single injection technique or double injection technique. I use a single injection technique because I found it more convenient. And you can use 40 milligram, which is one ml, and one ml of local anesthesia. Then can give under the USC guidance, or or you can give with your dying technique also. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Uh, do, uh, yeah, Doctor Vikas. Doctor yeah, yeah, Vikas. Yeah, Zulfi. Yeah. Uh, yeah I, I just want. Uh, yeah, I just want to know, Doctor Tahir. Nice presentation. I just want to when are you are doing the release procedure? Are you doing under tourniquet with breaker block or it's just a simple wrist block? Uh, this is I use Volant technique basically as advocated by Volant at uh, all. But uh, I use tourniquet initially for it sandwich because it the uh, effect of uh, adrenaline comes in around the twenty minutes or so twenty eight minutes exactly what it is in the book by Dolan uh, uh, Dolan uh, Donald Dolan Day. So. Uh, The surgery itself takes around ten minutes, but I start with two decay. If there is any problem, then I deflate the two decay. So this is valid. Uh, what is the relevancy? Is no two decay, but uh, I use two decay in that. I use uh, locally with adrenaline. Okay, thank you, Madhu. That means you are using a brachial block. No, 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 no. It's, it's a local. local it's a local, local without. Uh, local with adrenaline. Local with adrenaline. Yeah. Yeah. And okay, thank you very much for that. Zulfi, Zulfi, you were asking something. I just wanted to ask a question, perhaps to everybody. Uh, thank you for that talk. It was very interesting, and for your uh, operative uh, detail. Uh, right now, currently, with the COVID crisis in the United Kingdom, we have been advised not to infiltrate 
any soft tissues or joints with corticosteroids because this has been shown to increase the susceptibility. What is the current opinion of you guys? I think we have, we have the same guidelines. Steroids are for, it's, a, it's just only for uh, COVID thing. Okay, okay. And um, the uh, steroid, how often do you repeat this, uh, Tahir, for your uh, conservative uh, protocol? Uh, for uh, index finger, thumb, and ring finger, uh, minimum of two steroids I try in a duration of at least uh, six to eight weeks. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we need. Uh, Minute, uh, yes. I just want to ask Thai sir. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So Thai sir, uh, have you encountered any time of injury of uh, flexor tendons or neuroascular structures uh, at the A1 pulley during the percutaneous uh, dissection? No, I have not encountered yet, but there's always a risk. So uh, the buzzword always, uh, I'll say, the stay in midline. If you are not in midline, uh, you will, we will, there's always a chance of injury, but I'll say there's a learning curve. I never started from doing this. I have uh, already done a lot of uh, open surgery, epineurotomy. Then I did needle uh, percutaneous technique. So it's a safe, but uh, uh, I think uh, uh, for PGs who are listening, they should uh, first do for, uh, go for open surgery, then go for a uh, percutaneous technique. What is the opinion of other panelists about this? See, percutaneous, can I, can I take liberty? Yeah, yeah, please. Percutaneous, I have done it for my mother, I have done it for a few colleagues, but I'll say it's not simple. It's always there's a chance partial injury to the tendon can be there. Nose, etc. we can be careful, but tendon, the partial injury can be there. But uh, many times it's subclinical or it doesn't show so I'll still say, Dr. Kothal wants to say something. Yeah. Sir, how come mic? Your mic is muted. Uh, good talk, Tahir. Am I audible now? Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So uh, I want to ask you, Tahir, with this percutaneous uh, uh, procedure, uh, what is the, your experience about the recurrence? So there's always a chance of recurrence. Uh, one case I've seen with recurrence, uh, which uh, my resident has done that, but uh, I think it's related with the technique itself. Uh, if we have that feeling that gritty sensation has gone after uh, the bevel end of the needle is there, only then uh, uh, we should be sure of that there's complete release. And uh, uh, as described in the percutaneous epineurotomy for duplicate contracture, so uh, we do that also percutaneously with needle itself. So it's a minimally invasive technique which are evolving in hand surgery. So this is same as in Dupin. Uh, this is, uh, I have taken this from the green text of hand surgery. So it's the kind of standard. Okay. Dr. Vikas, Vineet is ready now. Yeah, Vineet, it's a very small presentation about malignant because proximal phalanx fracture uh, we could not cover whole talks, so he'll just talk about one of the cases. Uh, Yavinit, over to you. Yeah, so uh, proximal phalangeal fractures. In, uh, am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you for this opportunity, and I'll go on straight to the case. Uh, proximal phalangeal fracture, I feel, is the best if it is managed acutely in correct manner. However, we do come across these cases which have... Uh, not been uh, operated upon even though there was indication and even the conservative treatment was unsuccessful. The problem here is about 40 degrees of uh, flick of bowler angulation at the proximal phalangeal level. And this is the ring finger of the patient. He's a young male about two months down uh, in the injury level. I've tried to mark the outline because it's a two lateral view. The outline of the proximal phalanx has uh, been marked and the green uh, drawing is of uh, the extensive tendon which now is slack because of effective shortening of the length of the phalanx and that leads to a uh, extensive lag at the PIP joint which in uh, which if left like that will develop a fixed deformity at the PIP joint. 
it is uh, known that more than 30 degrees of polar angulation leads to a uh, pseudo cloying deformity and this is what we see clinically a flexion deformity at the pip joint in this patient and a pseudo claw like deformity of the ring finger uh so this patient was taken up for surgery the surgery is being done under volent as dr tahir has explained for other surgeries i have used a dorsal midline incision to, uh, split the extensor tendon i will come to why i split the extensor tendon and not went on this side uh, the malunion was nascent and it i could simply use my periosteum elevator to scrape off the newly formed callus and freshen the fracture and it was fixed with two k wires Now there are controversies. Obviously, we can use different methods of fixation. This is my preferred method. I feel the other methods of using intraosseous wires and plates would be a bit more damaging to the soft tissue. If I achieve good stability with two K wires, I go ahead with it. At the same time, we did a arthrolysis of the PIP joint through the same approach, and that is why I use a midline splitting approach. to do an arthrolysis from one of the sides is not possible then i have to use incision on both sides by going midline i can do a pip arthrolysis from the same incision and intra op photographs show a good flexion at the pip joint and a good extension a short video of intra operative movement of the patient this is immediately this is during the surgery and one of the advantages of doing the surgery under volent and this is the result at 3 uh, months we can see that the fracture united well there was no loss of reduction and i could mobilize the patient early there is still some flexion deformity which i expect arthrolysis never is very uh, rarely gives full range of motion we do expect some amount of flexion deformity and that is what we have got here uh, coming to the other scenario of proximal filing this is the second case and the only other case and this is a common problem even more severe than the shaft fracture this is a fracture of the neck of the proximal phalanx we can see that this patient also has come to us at 3 weeks there is callus visible dorsally now this patient has problem on both sides flexion and extension the extensor tendon means slack again causes a flexion deformity of the pip joint and further flexion is stopped by this bony uh, ridge uh, Quite a difficult problem for the patient. Index finger, no movement. Practically no movement. Only five to ten degrees of movement is available. Flexion deformity and restriction of flexion. So we did the same thing. Uh, dorsal midline approach, arthrolysis, osteoclasis of the nascent malunion, reduction. Just one K wire gave me enough stability for me to be able to mobilize this patient intraoperatively. We can see good range of motion, flexion and extension. unfortunately i don't have a long term clinical follow up uh, but there was no loss of reduction and i usually mobilize these patients from the second day itself i give them a hand uh, a customized splint which i have made myself and this splint is removable the patient removes and mobilizes the fingers and that's that's it about this topic another case with a similar problem and a similar treatment which was given I don't have uh, long-term follow-up pictures of these patients, but they did well. Thank you, uh, Dr. Vikas. Yeah. Uh, there is a question for Dr. Tahir Ansari from the audience. Yeah. yeah. That uh, uh, in trigger finger patients, can we inject steroid in diabetic patient? And if uh, we have to inject in diabetic, then what should be the blood sugar level? Yeah, Tahir. Yeah. <clears throat> it can definitely be injected in diabetic patient but uh, we have to uh, inform the patient there is less chance of uh, uh, getting relief because these patients overall have a poor prognosis and the second day, what is what should be the label it should be less than the fasting should be less than 150 mg uh, that's the value we must remember if it is more than what should be the fasting more than 150 then we should not inject the corticosteroid injection there is always chance of uh, 30 to 50 mg of uh, uh, sugar can be raised further so uh, we should discuss it should be less than 150 uh, dr vikas we have around 7 to 8 minutes so you take over for uh, in house discussion yep and then we wrap up uh, yep uh, any questions from the audience do you have any no 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 not till now uh, can i ask so, yeah yeah dr sure. dr vinay uh, uh, 
thanks for the short this uh, lecture you have given uh, my question is that in the fractures when there is a uh, there is a uh, fracture of the neck of the phalanx do you think one single wire will be uh, enough to hold the fracture uh, with a small fragment distally and then you say you can mobilize the next day uh, yes uh, it is it is uh, thank you for asking that it is odd and uh, definitely one can uh, quote literature that you know we need intraosseous wires and uh, all that but doing this surgery on the volant i ask the patient to move it actively and i'm looking at the fracture and these are cancellous bones non union is rare and i mean rare i've been doing these procedures with minimum fixation one wire or two wire whatever is uh, essential and i move the finger intraop actively i move it passively i look at the fracture site if it is stable i leave it at that when i started doing these procedures i was doing intraosseous wiring uh, a listless wiring technique one longitudinal wire and one square uh, with a ss wire about 24 gauge but that forces me to they knew the soft tissue on both sides also so the more i strip the extensor side i go on the flexor side also the more damage i cause plating is not available with me in the government hospital i'm uh, maybe if it is available i might try to use it currently i don't have it so this uh, this is what i have been doing until now i have not come across any failures these are only three cases which are shown i've done i've been doing this procedure with other fingers also no uh, no failure has come across to me thank you anil wants to ask something okay uh, if uh, we have time and no questions can i uh, yeah can i put one case for discussion i Just think hitesh hitesh wants to ask yeah. i think yeah, let hitesh. us hitesh you mute discussion i can want to give a comment only that's all you can put a case for discussion so uh, yeah vikas you can have one case okay you just tell me when time is up we will stop there we have 5 minutes you can show show a short or we can go fast yeah it's a it's just continuation with the dr kotwal's talk like druj thing so i just picked up a case uh, can you so this was a young male had a wrist injury uh, looks like a looks like a uh, steroid fracture and this was treated elsewhere but because it's uh, this is uh, i can't ask for the show of hands and i'll just go through quickly just to give the message so when you see something like this it's not a simple fracture because whenever we see a fracture we miss other things there is a overlap of distal radial ulnar joint but uh, this was missed earlier it was treated somewhere else uh, with a new plate that time this plate was launched so someone picks distal ulna completely fixed but what happens later on the druj is dislocated because earlier the druj was dislocated in the in this slide also but this was missed and steroid was fixed and patient came to us with this uh, dislocation so what we did was a adam borger procedure what anil was talking and professor kotwal was discussing it's a simple procedure when you use a tendon i'll just you use a tendon palmaris longus tree palmaris longus tendon through the two tunnels radius and ulna and we create a joint the reason for me to uh, discuss was the other things also you have to compare the stability for the pgs who are uh, seeing this we would like to see whenever we see a fracture we should not miss on things which are occurred so this was uh, and uh, regarding the reconstruction uh, there was an acute cases or sub uh, little bit chronic if arthrosis is not there the salvage procedures we should not be doing we should be trying to be more anatomical in reconstruction of ligaments and other things any comments from the panel uh vikas if, if i may uh, yeah, give yeah, a sure. comment thank you it's a different i think that's a very valuable lesson you know just relying on the um on the ap x-ray 
and presuming that you've got anatomical reduction. And um, I'd like to thank Professor Cotwell for his talk. I think it should be stressed that the um, Soveca pungi um, is for uh, uh, existing arthritis of the DRUJ joint. Exactly what you said. It's not for the primary uh, DRUJ um, injuries. Uh, the ECU uh, tendon is an extremely important stabilizer and should not be underestimated when you're performing the Soveca pungi procedure. It should always be respected and remain dorsally placed following that procedure. My experience with the Darach with the rheumatoids has been excellent, but only in the, in the rheumatoids. I would say in the uh, osteoarthritic, post-traumatic arthritic uh, population, it is the work of the devil. Yeah. Because Darach, you, you, you will anatomy. fail. Darach, we are losing anatomy. I think it's... it's Yes, I, I don't think there's a place for Darach anymore. It's a simple procedure. It's very easy. It's done under very minor anesthesia. And the first few weeks, it's excellent. But the next months, you know, we've really got a big problem on our hands. That's my I personal mean, experience. I wanted to share that with everybody here, what their experience with the Darach. Anil, you, Anil, you were in that meeting uh, with the Green, where he showed his Darach 20, 22 times. Yeah, he had to revise the direction. Yeah, for me it is uh, basically I look at it as uh, ulnocarpal joint and radio ulna joint. So when we have something exclusive to the radio ulna joint, my choice is always in the punjis. And when you have something of radio ulna, I mean ulno radial joint, ulnocarpal joint rather, like the X-ray you showed just now, with that ulna styloid process fracture and everything might go for an ulnocarpal arthritis later. And that is when a Darius would be a much better option in that particular patient. When this isolated DRUJ involvement, obviously it's the Kapanjis. And as Sir has showed, even with the Darax, if you stabilize the proximal uh, stump, it works well, except that the ulna support is gone. But if you have a combined ulnocarpal arthritis and DRUJ arthritis kind of thing, a Darax would be a better option than just going for a Kapanji's procedure. Uh, other thing I wanted to say for the postgraduates is for the DRUJ. We see a lot of times uh, with the X-ray, what you showed is a very classical thing where there is an overlap, that is a clue. And a lot of times there could be the impaction of the DRUJ there and it won't be reduced and patients come back later or there could be a gross instability also. All I say is just always take both sides x-rays and if at all you're asking for a CT scan, take CT scans of both the wrists in identical positions and that will solve a lot of these missed injuries, especially with DRUG. Uh, Dr. Vikas, yeah. Uh, I think uh, we will have your closing uh, comments now. You and Dr. Sharas closing uh, comments because uh, we have to wrap up the meeting. Yeah. Before we close, I must thank all my faculty members. Professor um, Kothwal, uh, Zulpi, Nathanel, Dr. Tahir, Vineet, Ajit. I must thank you all for taking up time for the money and for giving me this opportunity closing Faculty. I'm, I'm sure I'm going much, much wiser on all these topics. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Good night. I'm sure you can. You want to say anything, Hitesh? Yeah, I thank you all from the Delhi Orthopedic Association side. This was a second hand course. Previous was also a hit. And I thank uh, Dr. Vikas, Dr. Manish Daman for the support, and Dr. respected Dr. Kotwar. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, sir. Sir. thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for uh, giving this wonderful opportunity. Thank you. 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 Thank you.